Hi, welcome everybody to our presentation of iAsync Enumerable and iObservable. These are two interfaces that exist inside the .NET framework. They exist by default, so they're not something you're going to have to add as a library. However, they are something that you're going to want to add libraries for. It becomes a lot easier to work with them and provides a lot of extra functionality that is just much easier to live with. So in this presentation, we will be talking about making asynchronous code easier to work with and how to use these two interfaces in order to give some or give your code a more cohesive feel rather than the confusion and jumbled mess that can happen when we're doing asynchronous code. So let's dive in. These were both introduced uh, quite a while ago, but they haven't received a lot of widespread usage in mainstream. I think because they're so, I'm not even sure what the word is, but uh, they're not difficult to understand, but it's just hard to find the use case for them in a lot of cases. So with iAsync enumerable, you're going to have an enumerable collection just like you're used to with IE enumerable. There really is no difference as far as that is concerned. The main difference is that where I as I enumerable is a collection where you've already got the collection somewhere in memory or it's going to be read deferredly through a database, somewhere that collection already exists from start to beginning. The exception to that, of course, is with coroutines, which I do point out here. Uh, those can be made as an infinite series. Uh, I suppose you could come up with an infinite series in other ways as well. That's the easiest one that I could think of. But for the most part, with IEnumerable, you're going to be dealing with a known collection. Because IEsync enumerable is an IEnumerable, there is that same requirement. However, each item in the enumerable is intended to be loaded asynchronously. This is useful if you do have something where you're trying to load a lot of data from the website, as a website, and each item needs to be loaded in as it's able to be retrieved. Um, it could be something from a database. It can be a number of different things where you require a synchronous collection of that data. I observable, on the other hand, oh, and I async in a rule does work with async and await, um, as async should imply, and it does work with coroutines, just like enumerable, where again, the difference is going to be that in the coroutine for I async enumerable, that work is going to be done asynchronously. And we will talk about coroutines if you're not sure what those are. For iObservable, it is a pretty standard publish subscribe model, wherein you have one publisher that is going to be providing the data, and you have one or more, or potentially no, subscribers for said data. The observable won't really be kicked off until you have at least one subscriber. However, once that subscriber is created, that data can just continue to run. As far as how you're going to use an iObservable, it's similar to an event. The difference is with an observable, you don't have to tie yourself directly into the class that holds that event. You can use this interface to abstract into that source of data. And observables can even be used to wrap events. So they're not having to deal with those if you choose not to. They are useful for when your data can't be stored or gathered, I guess, at once. So with iAsync enumerable and iEnumerable, as I mentioned, you have this notion of, I have a start and an end to my data. It's going to exist somewhere, but I have this collection known. It might need to be loaded asynchronously, but I have this collection that I'm generally going to be iterating at once. With an observable, you don't really have any idea of how many items there may be in there, and you don't know when that observable is going to end. It's useful for when data could just be volunteered at any point in time and you be doing other things in the meantime. Uh, it's useful for when you just want to have something to notify you of something like an event, but you don't want to be tied to something. Again, these can work with async and await. Uh, that requires help from a library. The one we're going to be using here is system.reactive, but that library will give you an idea of where or what can be done with that observables. Um, the subscriptions for an observable do need to be disposed, so keep that in mind. If you don't dispose them, you're going to leave yourself open to memory leaks or infinitely running observables. 
uh, the number of problems that you just don't want to have to deal with. So make sure to dispose your subscriptions. The easiest way, of course, is just with a using statement, but sometimes you want to do things a bit more long running, in which case you just need to take care of that subscription. To contrast the two, each item in an async enumerable is loaded asynchronously, but you know more or less that there's going to be a certain collection. Because it's a non enumerable, that data generally is only going to be started when the item is needed, meaning as you're iterating through the enumerable, you're going to be loading that data as it comes in rather than all at once. You can, of course, load up all at once if you would like, but generally the idea of an IC sync enumerable is that you're loading it in as it's needed. If, like I said, you're using coroutines or generators, this series can be infinite. However, for the most part, you do have an idea of what that set looks like. With an I enumerable, generally you can do things like dot count with some of the link methods and get an idea of how many items are in there. And there's this there's, there's notion of beginning and end with I enumerable. I observable, however, is not that way. You really don't have an idea from when it starts what those items are going to look like. Observables are generally intended to be something that can go on forever. When you do a dot count, which you can do with the right, right libraries, you are never going to get that result back until that entire observable sequence has been completed. And of course, that's the same with an enumerable. You need to enumerate the whole sequence before you can count. However, with that observable, that may take long periods of time to do simply because you don't know when that data is going to We'll give examples of these as we go. So observables are more likely to be used as a replacement for .NET events. Those are, again, if we want to abstract knowledge about what that event is or where it lives, then we can use the observable interface to wrap it. But in other ways, we can do things uh, to just give us more control. We can filter those events. We can use different link methods to aggregate data. We can, we can do a lot more with our observable than we can with standard events. So this gives us a lot of flexibility. As far as similarities go, honestly, I thought there were going to be more similarities than this. And it turned out that there were only just the three that I can come up with. They both are sequences of data. It's pretty obvious. They can both be awaited until completion, and they can both be filtered and aggregated and so on and so on using link. Other than that, there isn't a lot that's similar to them. They're both used pretty differently, and the use cases for each are also pretty different. So let's jump into some code examples because I feel like that's going to be where we get a better handle on how this stuff works. Let's go ahead and zoom in the code size here. So I've just got a basic project. It's just a console application. There's really nothing special to it. I, I don't have anything in here yet. However, the one thing that I have started with, if we look at our media packages, is system.reactive and system.reactive.link. This is going to be, well, these are going to be the two of the libraries that give us a lot of utility and more functionality out of our observables. I async enumerable, for the most part, we can deal with it. There will be a library that adds later. It gives us more, that's kind of where we're at now. Um, to give us more functionality. So the one for uh, I think enumerable is going to be system.link.async. It's right here. We're also going to add in system.link.async.queryable. Again, these are just going to provide, actually, I don't think we need this for this demo. These are just going to provide more link-like support for I async enumerable. We can go ahead and install this. I uh, queryable, if we want to be using query providers, we can, but this demo, I don't think I'm doing that, so I'm going to go ahead and leave that off. But this one, for sure. So those are the only two things that I've added, just to show you again, the system.reactive stuff and the async link stuff. So let's come here. Let's just give a, a quick, basic run through of something we can do with these two systems. Uh, and the person that came to mind for me is I've always wanted to be able to do a Fibonacci sequence with observables or with async. It's very, very simple, um, really nothing to it. 
So let's just go ahead and get started. The first one I'm going to be using is the IASIS enumerable. Um, hopefully my keyboard isn't too terribly loud. So we're just going to create a static method in async. It's going to return an IASIS enumerable. And notice it doesn't know what it is. So I'm going to go ahead and use the using the statement. I'm just going to have it return an int. And we'll go ahead and give it a name. And let's give it the option of specifying a max number of items. Okay, now in this code, I'm going to be using two variables that are going to be used to a order. So we're going to call it next and current. Okay, our current value is going to be zero. Next one's going to be one on the Fibonacci. So from here, I'm just going to say, oops, yeah, yeah. Count is also zero. I'm just going to say I want my count to be less than whatever the max is that they have given us. While this is true, I'm going to generate a new sequence. This is actually going to be using those coroutines I talked about earlier, but it will also using the isolated basic enumerable. I'll show you how that works. So first thing I'm going to do is yield return current. Okay, this yield return syntax is part of a coroutine. You may have heard other terms to describe the minus coroutine as a term. But this yield return is going to essentially say, all right, whenever somebody tries to enumerate the sequence, run through here, when they get to this point in the code, break in the code and return back this number as the first item in the enumerable. From here, once they try to enumerate the second item, the code will pick back up at this spot and continue running the next line. So the next line, we're going to want to say temp equals current, current equals next, next equals temp plus current. So in the Fibonacci sequence, to create the next value in the sequence is found by summing the previous two. In this case, we have zero and one, meaning the next value. So current is temp, which is zero. Current becomes next, which means it's one, which means this is going to be zero plus one. So next becomes one. Current is also one. So next time I'm here, we're going to check our value. This is then going to return a one. So the first value is zero, then one. Current will again be assigned one. Next will be one plus one, which is two. The next value will be two. Anyway, we'll see that up there. I'm actually going to do this. We can run into a wait. Our Fibonacci AC. So now that I've got this Fibonacci AC, this will run perfectly well as it is. So let's go ahead and just do this and say, uh, oh, we haven't talked about how to use the async enumerable though. There are two ways. One is to get the enumerable. Let's just say first 10 values. And now that I have this enumerable, and you can see it's an isolated enumerable, there are a couple of things I can do. Uh, the first thing is get this async enumerator. Okay, and then this enumerator has two methods on it. One is a move next async, that was three. Well, things we care about, move next async and current. Current is going to give me the value that we have currently, obviously named. Move next async is going to move the next value here. And you notice that does return a Boolean. So one way to use this is to say while enumerator dot move next async. And because that's a task, we want to await that. And then while we're in here, what's going to happen is it will run this first move next async is going to kick off this enumerator, which means it's going to actually start running this code. We're going to await for that to happen because we're never actually doing anything that requires any sort of tasks in here. It's going to immediately return and give us our value. Then I can just come in and do something simple like console.writeLine, and then I can say enumerator.current. 
Let's give, our, oops, give ourselves a notice. Work. Let's go ahead and run it. Now we're a little slow to get this over here, but hopefully you saw that just very quickly enumerated our values. So there's absolutely nothing special about what's going on here. This just runs as a normal enumerator. Okay, now that we've got something in here, let's go ahead and do something to pretend that this current value is taking some amount of time to actually be generated. So we're just going to await a task.delay. Let's have a wait 300 milliseconds. Go ahead and run this again. And now you can see that each value is being loaded in much more slowly with a 300 millisecond delay. So obviously this is a very contrived example. You're never going to be writing code like this. I so hope you're never going to be writing code like this. But it gives you an idea of how to actually use the async enumerator. However, this thing generates its stuff, we can do things with it. Now, this is the hardest way to actually use this. This does work, but if you ever had to do the enumerators in .NET 2, I think it was, if they had enumerators, um, this became, actually .NET 1 probably had enumerators. History of .NET all confused my brain at this point. This becomes not difficult to work with, but not pleasant to work with. So fortunately, there is a better way of dealing with these async enumerables. With regular enumerables, we can just use a for each. Oops. And then do something like that. Okay, now this isn't happy because a for each works off of an I enumerable. This is not, I know I said earlier it's an I enumerable, it's not actually an I enumerable. What I meant by that is that it's an I enumerable in the sense that it's a collection of values. Now, if we look at this interface, we can see that it's not actually an I enumerable. This is a base interface just like I enumerable is. Okay, so because this isn't an I enumerable, we can't use it with for each. So it's giving us an error. So what we actually want is this await for each. Now, this may be a new construct for some reason where what's going to happen is this is essentially wrapping up the code we had in here before into this for each statement. So rather than having to get the enumerator and then await what's been seen within the while and then doing while move next, all that's handled for you just with this await for each. And because this is an async enumerable, it's going to await each item through the for each. So go ahead and run this again. Just like before, we get our numbers enumerated back more slowly. And there we are. So two ways we can work with them. This is going to be by far the most simple, but obviously you want to be doing something more complex if you're using this memorable part of that than just for reaching them. So we'll do some more fancy stuff in a bit. So now that we have that, let's go ahead and start on our observable usage. So we're going to be doing the same thing. where I'm going to just create a static method. But this time I'm going to return my observable along with our max. Okay, now this is going to be a little bit different because rather than being able to use something like a generator where I can have my code work and have it be readable and make sense, um, the observables are gonna be a little bit more different. Now, what I could do is return a task and have the task running in the background thread. And we'll do some of that later. For simplicity, just because I want to show how to use observables, I'm going to use this observable class that comes from the system.reactive libraries. And this will allow me to create a bunch of different types of observables. In this case, I'm going to be using range. And I'm going to say I want to go from zero. I want to get maps. And I want to select We actually don't need the count, so I can actually ignore that just with an underscore. But here we're going to do the exact same thing we did up in the Fibonacci basic, which is taking the value that I want, which is our current. In this case, we will return current. In this case, I want a 
something like that for a minute. And then going to calculate the next value, the next two values. Because I'm not going to get the chance later. Up here, this would pause for a second and then come back where I can calculate the values continue going. We don't have that option here, so just a simple select statement. So then I can return value. Next time it comes through, that value will already be the one. So up here, there is no fancy built in syntax. We'll go ahead and comment that up. It'll allow me to just deal with those observables. So instead, what I need to do is get the observable. And again, just say 10. Okay, now I need to subscribe to my observable. I can get the value. All right, so this observable up here before, just like we had with the enumerable and the enumerator, we had to tell the enumerator to move next before it would actually take anything off. Likewise, with the observable, I have to subscribe before any of this is going to really care to do anything. That's not always the case, but here it should be. Oh, here it is, not should be. So that's going to be fine. And I can go ahead and run this. Go ahead and do that, and I'll show you. Okay, here are our values. I can just press anything to continue. Okay, and you saw that we did get these values before we got to the right and right. That's just because this range is just like an enumerable, where it's going to take and generate all these values as soon as I tell it to call a range, which means this observable has a start and a finish. As soon as it's created, that may not always be the case. We may need to wait for this observable to finish because these are being generated asynchronously, in which case, what we can do is say await observable. Okay, now this will actually hang on until the subscription, until the observable is finished. Then we'll go ahead and continue on with the next piece. So it won't look any different from the console. Something to get over here fast enough to show loading, but there we have our terminals. Okay, so very contrived, but intro level example of how to use I async enumerable and observable. Async enumerable, again, we have the option of using the enumerators, just like we did with I enumerable. With the more fancy await for each, we have a bit more precise syntax. With observables, we just need to subscribe and then we can get our values. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to a more practical use of something that we're going to use potentially in an actual example. To do that, I'm going to go ahead and add another new package. This is one that I recommend to everybody. This is Floral. And Floral is a web utility library, so we don't have to manage any of the HTTP clients or creating query parameters or any of that kind of stuff. It just sort of does everything for us. So now that I've got that, um, I'm going to go ahead and just ignore all of this. All right, so that's gone. We can add some more stuff. So the first thing I want to do is I'm going to create a method and I'm using async enumerable to start. But I want to make a web request that's going to get some piece of data. Normally, this would be useful if we're going to be loading in, you know, say a user has some collection of items. Um, we need the example of a vehicle, you know, programming, you know, input a programming example of a vehicle. Say a user has some collection of vehicles. And I want to get the data for each vehicle. So I could start with the IDs that I have stored locally for each of these vehicles. And let's say our web server just doesn't have the notion of a batch load. I have to load each one individually. Well, if I could load them in batch and I could just return them as an I enumerable and we're good to go. But because I need to load them individually, 
now I need to load each one as I'm able to load it. So I can't do them all at the same time. So to start off, I'm going to create another method. I use enumerable. And this would be where we have our, you know, our vehicle being returned or whatever data we actually care to load. In this case, I'm just loading as an int that I'm going to use. I'm going to just have it generate a random number. Well, it's not going to generate a random number. It's going to load a random number from the website. So we're going to return an int. And I'm going to call this int random number sync. Okay, now, uh, again, what I can do is I can pass in some collection of IDs. In this case, I'm going to pretend I just have them here. And I'm just going to say IDs equals enumerable namespace dot range. And let's start with one. We'll have to generate 10 IDs for this. Okay, so now I have this enumerable. And then I can say IDs dot to async enumerable. Okay, now this is going to convert this to an async enumerable. So now I can actually use my async enumerable items as they're meant to be. One of those items I'm going to be using is this select await. Okay, here you notice that the item is going to take a point and return a task. In this case, it's a value task. So I'm going to say my ID. And now in here, I can go ahead and load. Oops. Let's see. I can go ahead and load whatever vehicle information, whatever I'm trying to load from my web URL or wherever as I'm doing. Because I'm not actually using that here, I'm not going to really use that ID. I'm just going to be using a website that I found. Get a random number. And then I need to bring in the flow namespace. This will allow me to post a URL, uh, post a web request. Okay. Uh, it needs to be URL encoded, which is why this post URL encoded. Then I'm going to pass in the parameters that I need. In this case, it's a min, which is be one. And the max can be 100. There we go. Okay. All right. Wondering that was weird, but I'm not finishing. So. so now that I've got this, I can post the URL and then I post to the URL and it'll go ahead and transfer this data as URL code data. Now I need to receive the response. And it's just going to be a string response. It's just going to be the number that I want. And then I can return parse number. Okay. Oops. All right, so I have my get random numbers AC, number AC. This will go ahead and load in each number as it's, as it's available, get that information, and away we go. So now up here, I might need to do a hair and start. Let's say getting random numbers from the server. Okay, and I'm going to use my await for each of them. Here's my number. Okay, so there's my random number. Now I can just say console.writeline, just like before. And we have our pressing the key to continue. So let's go ahead and load this. Okay, so we have the random number from the server. I'm going to go ahead and try to retrieve these. 
So you can see all those requests coming in. That first one took a little bit of time, but after that, the server was able to go and it was responding more quickly. Okay, so we can see that works. And again, this is a much cleaner way of doing things than how you would used to be forced to do them. I have before what I would normally try to do is something like this, where I would say public static cast. Actually, this would be recent cast of I enumerable of whatever type I want to return, in this case hint. Just not working on these. And then what I would do is the same kind of thing where I have my IDs. And then I would have to do something like pass equals IDs dot select. I'm just going to copy this in. This needs to be in sync. And then I would need to do await pass dot all and then I can return tasks dot select these select two dot result. Okay, and this will return my IME mode. So this is going to accomplish essentially the same thing where I'm getting a bunch of asynchronous data. And the way it goes, I won't be able to use a wait for each. I would need to do something like numerable. Well, actually, that's what I would do is for each. Okay, so something like that. Not quite the same thing. The difference here is that with my get random number async with the tasks in it. This is going to try to get all of the data back, and I can't do anything with that data until all of it has returned. That's because of this when all piece here. I could maybe do something with a colon team um, that would be tricky, but ultimately, if I was in the colon team, I'm going to be doing the same thing as I would down here. There's really no reason to try to finagle that into the work. With this piece up here, then, once I start my full reach, it's every bit of data that has come back. With the original, this allows me to go in, load the first item. As soon as it comes back, now I can start processing it, then load the next one. Now, if I want to load all of them in parallel, you know, I could do something like as parallel. I can elaborate to that. Um, actually, probably doesn't work with that. Easy. Anyway, I can parallelize these and make them so they're all running at the same time. But for the most part, the point of this is that I can load them as they're needed, which means I'm not having to wait for the entire collection to come out. I can get the one that I need, work with it, then get the next one. So that's the advantage of the Plus, this is a lot easier to read and work with than this. They having to do all these tasks, manage them yourselves. While not terribly difficult with this example, you can imagine these cases where this becomes a nightmare quickly. So, go ahead and remove that. So, again, using our async enumerables, we have the option of taking something we need to generate or gather asynchronously, but still use it in a pretty straightforward way. Somebody can come in and read this and understand pretty quickly what it is we're trying to accomplish. So, let's create another header. So now we're going to be using the observable. Right, before we do that, let's just uh, create our method and make it easier for us. Open my notes. All right. And this time we're going to do that. All right, now. Last time we just had all the enumerable data generated right up front. In this case, we're going to say that we don't actually want to do that. So I'm going to create a subject. Now subject, space, 
is what we use when we want to push data on the observer. We want to actually control the observable data. That's going to be the subject that allows us to do that. So when we return a subject, the subject is an I observable. The I observable only allows you, that interface only allows you to read data. But subjects, I can actually go ahead and push data onto the observable, which is what we want in this case. Because subjects don't implicitly allow us to do things asynchronously, though, I need to do something in a background thread. So to that, I'm just going to use this task.run. I'm going to go with initial run. This is not good practice, by the way, you want to always manage your tasks. But in this case, I'm going to go ahead and do it. It does demos. Um, there will be a time in the middle when I'm not just doing the task that run to use my observables. So don't worry, we'll, we'll show that. But this will give you an idea of how we can use observables to generate data. So inside this task that run, well, what's going to happen is this subject is going to be created. Task that run will get spun off on a background thread, and then go ahead and return subject. Okay, so up here in our main, we'll be able to subscribe to that subject. But now this is happening completely untethered to up here, which means if I just let this go, it's going to go ahead and continue on because the subscription has no reason to stop. So we'll get this pressing a key before the, the observable finishes. So let's go ahead and generate some data with it. So let's just do 10 values. Um, I'm going to go ahead and use this endpoint again. All right, just like before, we're going to go out and get that data. In this case, though, rather than being able to use our coroutine syntax to just yield the data back up, here I need to use the subject to go ahead and push that data on. So now I can say subject dot on next. Okay, and then now that I have that, I can just do int dot parse number, and this is going to trigger that subscription listener. So let's come up here and create that. Knows we're using our using statement here to dispose of our subscription properly. All right. So now that we have the subscription, we can talk about this more. So this callback here, this action we're passing in. This is going to get invoked when we call on next. Now, this isn't a direct call because we can have multiple subscriptions, but this on next is going to trigger this candle or this handler with the value that we passed in. In this case, it'll be you know, the first value here, the next value, the next value, and so on, so on, and so on. Okay, so this is going to run relatively quickly. The difference, though, is that with our async enumerable down here, this one. Once we're done with our select statement, or rather, once we've enumerated everything in our range, this enumerator just ends, and our for each up here ends as well. We don't have that with this. Once this for runs, that subject is still live. There's nothing telling it that the subject is finished. So once the for is done, we need to actually come in and say we are completed, and this will finish. The observable. So the subscription is now done. Well, I guess the subscription is so the observable is done. Okay, and then because it's good practice, go ahead and dispose our subject now that it's completed. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and run this without waiting for that subscription to end just to show you what's going to happen. Okay, so just like before, we get numbers from our server. And notice here we have starting random number observable, and then immediately press any key to continue. So this is again that case where I talked about that the subscription 
And there's nothing waiting for that subscription to finish. I guess not the subscription, but the observable to finish. So this code just goes ahead and runs for the next line of code. This is all happening on the background. Go ahead and enter and continue. So, like we did before, I can go ahead and await the observable. And now what will happen is it will wait for this to finish. This will continue to block until on completed is called. So this can be dangerous. If you don't know that an observable is ever going to end, then you may run into a situation where you have code that just never finishes. So you want to make sure you're doing the appropriate thing. In this case, I know that this is going to end after 10 runs, so I can go ahead and await it. So now let's run our code. And you run over from the server. Now we start the observable. This gets back more of our random values. Then we get our pressing and the position. Okay, so we want to use that await appropriately so that we get the behavior that we need. Again, we're using that with an observable. Those observables are, they are uh, async await compatible if we're using the system.reactive library. So we provide a get awaiter method for observables, and it works. But again, we want to make sure that's, that's the appropriate thing to do. Um, notice that it's, it's giving me the use disposable or use discard value. What will actually happen is by awaiting this, generally when you await something, you know, when I await the memorable down here, I'm getting a value back, I'm getting that int back each time through. With an observable, because everything's happening through our subscription, you might be confused about what happens, but what the library does is this will actually give us the last value published on this observable. So I can say last value, and then I can say, So I can actually publish the last value. If all I cared about is the last thing, I wouldn't even have to subscribe. I could just say await oh, and then get the last one. So the last one is for one. That being second. So again, I can, depending on what I want to do with this subscription, because of how I'm going to run on a background thread, we want to make sure we're dealing with that. And so we're going to use the await. Oh, I always just assume whatever method I'm calling. Whatever's happening, if it's an observable, is going to be done on some background thread. So I always make sure that I handle this subscription, whether that be through an await or whether I tell it um, through the subscribe. You notice know, one of the options is add on completed. So I can come in here and do something like, uh, you know, if I had a task completion source that I was starting, I could finish it here and continue on, or set some Boolean flag, or whatever else I needed to do. Okay, we can also handle exceptions here, which we haven't done so far, which means rather than just looking at on next line completed, it's possible that one of these web calls shows an exception. So if we look at the IntelliSense here, we notice that we have a couple of overlays. One of them is to get the next value. The next is to get an exception to whatever happened. This exception will potentially cause this to stop and then just stop publishing values. I can set this up to continue on error if I want to, um, but this gives me at least a chance to deal with the error. I can also obviously use cancellation tokens if I want, but I can also look at the on error and on completed states. So depending on what I want to do, if I need to deal with the exception, I can do that. If I need to deal with the completed state, I can do that. So the subscribe method handles all of those. So now we've got this, let's go on to a bit more with our observables. I'm gonna go ahead and comment up the old stuff. Go ahead and hide it. You mentioned it was an event, but oh well. So let's create another observable method. And one, challenge that we like to do at Mindfire is the FizzBuzz challenge. So if you're not familiar with it, FizzBuzz is, it used to be a drinking game. Um, you can find it a number of other places. I just, the group 
frames, whatever. But the logic is you're going to iterate from one through 100. You don't want to iterate actually it's 99 times. If the value is divisible by one, then we want to output this. If the value is divisible by five, or sorry, not one, geez. So if it's divisible by three, we want to output this. If it's divisible by five, we want to output buzz. If it's both, we want to output this buzz. And if it's none of the above, we want to output just the number. Okay, so those are our rules for this buzz. We want to use observables to complete this challenge. To do that, I'm going to start by having all of the numbers generated, one through 100. Of course, I could pass in a value here to give me that range if I want to, but we're going to go ahead and do that here. And now that I've got that observable, I can use some of our oh so wonderful link methods to do some filtering. So I want to get all the numbers that are divisible by three. So I'm going to say where I mod three equal zero. Okay, so for every number that's generated in here, this where is going to be applied. And if the number is divisible by three, then this by three is going to fire a subscription. Okay, now I don't care about the number itself in this particular case. What I want is this. So I'm going to go ahead and select this. Okay, likewise, If it's divisible by five, then I want to output. And I want buzz. Okay. And lastly, if i mod five is not equal to zero, and i mod three is not equal to zero. Then Output the number. All right, so I have my math, my cases that I care about. So again, we're using the link methods to do this. So just like I could with a normal enumerable, I can use where. And this is going to go ahead and filter out any of those values. So this is a new observable. You can see it is an I observable. So by three is an observable, which itself can be subscribed to. So whatever is generating my observable values, I can go ahead and filter those off and get just the ones that I care about. And the minute we're going to be doing that with events, then I only get the events that I care about. So in this case, I'm just getting numbers of by three. Here I'm just getting numbers of by five. And here I'm just getting the numbers where it's divisible by neither of those. Okay, now because I want to have this iterate as a, a collection rather than just disparate observables. What I'm going to do is say collection. And I'm going to start with my number and I'm going to now merge two observables together. So I'm going to merge number, then I'm going to merge that with by three, which means this thing's going to trigger. First one number is only one. One is not divisible by three or five which means numbers where clause is going to go through, it'll select this, which means this thing's subscription value is going to fire. So when I merge these two together, it's going to create one observable between them. You can see here merge returns an observable. And that first value, because number is going to be the only one that fires, that first value fired from here is going to be the number that I care about. Two will be the same way. Three, however, will trigger through this pipeline. So it's going to select this, and it's not going to trigger to either of these, which means when its subscription fires, this again will fire as well. So collection will get that value and receive this. Okay, if I wanted to, I could just say number is observable by select by that two string. And if I did that without the where clause here, I would see both this and the number that it's supposed to represent. So this case would be three and this. So I should see both of those together. Okay, once I've got that, 
I want to merge by five. Okay, so now I've got all three of my cases uh, fired. And actually, we'll see something where this happens, where 15 is going to go through both this pipeline and this pipeline, because by three happens first, fizz will come first, then by five buzz, we'll actually get another fizz buzz, both happening to our collection. Okay, so from here, I can go through the, the typical things we've done, been doing before, where I can subscribe to this and then do whatever I need to watch the subscription. But in this case, I don't care about the subscription itself. What I can do instead is say to enumerable. And this will actually go ahead and take and create an enumerable from our observables. And what this is going to do is just like with the async enumerable, where this is going to, you know, the first value goes in and goes out and asynchronously grabs data and comes back. This thing can do that, but in this case, I'm using enumerable, which what that means is I'm going to get the first value. If there's any sort of delay, it will just block until that delay happens. Because I know this is going to be just a straight run, I already have all these values, I'm going to be using two enumerable. But if for some reason I need to make this asynchronous, some of you may have seen it, I do actually have two async enumerable, in which case now I can get that same functionality where this thing runs as expected, but each value is loaded with synchronously. And so I can actually combine those two technologies to get what I need. But in this case, I'm just going to use a little bit because I know it's on the same thread. Then I can go ahead and do a rep line and just say, I'm going to go my screen. Okay. And that should give us a fizz buzz. There's obviously no reason to make this async pass because I need this here. But again, in case this were all happening on the background here, which I can do, then it's going to go ahead and run. All right, so now that I've got this, I can just say wait fizz buzz. Go ahead and run it. And I don't think I'm going to be able to move it quickly enough, but yeah, not even close. We can see that it does work. So we have one, two, fizz, four, buzz, fizz, seven, eight, fizz, buzz, one, two, fizz, blah, blah, fizz, buzz. Okay, so we do get both of those. Unfortunately, I've done a stupid where I've combined them with comma. Um, that's just because I'm doing the string join, and both these are firing in disparate pieces. If I wanted to do it, I guess more for the life, I could do separator. So, and then I could do merge separator. Okay, in which case, let's see, I'm going to do string dot join right there. And block. Okay, so one, two, fizz, four buzz, three, blah, blah, blah. 15 now is fizz buzz. The difference is that now this ends with the comma, the previous one didn't, so it could close it. Um, but again, this all works, and now we have a working fizz buzz using observables. And if this range needs to be something that was loaded asynchronously, so just like down here, where we're doing a task.run, I can create the subject. And now I'm tempted to do that. Yeah, let's go ahead and do it. Real quick. Subject. And then let's do so let's go away. Let's just do a hundred milliseconds. Subject dot on next. Yeah, that's my. So 
semicolon from the previous thing and pretend it's a semicolon from the next thing. It's just a little hot. Okay. So now my observable is subject dot. Observable. Don't actually have to do that because we just use the subject. But just to make things clear. Okay, go ahead and do this, and then actually should have worked because I threw him over. Uh, 100 milliseconds on 100 meters. That's going to be a little bit of time. That may have been a mistake. Oh well. There we go. So, so we can see those are now all asynchronously loaded. Oops. Because I started with zero. All right. Well, if I started with one like I was supposed to, then you can see this would be exactly the same output, which is pretty handy. Okay. Again, if I wanted to say now that these are asynchronous, I can say two asynchronous. Okay, and then rather than doing the console that line, I can say await for each number in collection. No, oh, it's moving it there. All right, now you. Okay, so now this time we should get the exact same thing. I should have lowered that below. Oh well. And we've got some cleanup to do um, because each of these are firing differently now that I've got the separator. So you can still see one, two, three, four, five, six, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so it is still working. Uh, just that uh, because I've got the separator and because I've got the funnel here and because each of these is separate. Anyway, this is what happens when you decide to do things that aren't part of your script in the middle of the presentation. So again, you can see how they're mixable and how they should work uh, just differently from each other, depending on the event or the uh, application that you want. So let's uh, go on to using an event. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new class down here. And our test event bars has that. And the translation source. Take a space for that. All right, this is going to have a start and an end method. We're going to check to see if the cancellation source is not one, meaning I already have something running, then go ahead and cancel. And I can create a new one. And I can create my background task, the background thread. Again, we don't want to just do pass that run for everything. So in this case, I'm going to. And because I want to hang on to this and I want to make sure that I don't have any oops, crossover, like this thing getting set to null, like this is still running, I'm going to get a local value of it. 
and we'll say local while not canceled. And I'm going to notify, which is going to be firing off this event. I'm going to use my question mark here. Okay, go ahead and fire off my event. And then let's give ourselves a little bit of a delay. And we're done. So once start is called, this would go ahead and just run basically an infinite loop. So 500 milliseconds between each notification, each event file. Then I'm going to give myself a way of ending it. And this can be to simulate anything that you know has a like a long running piece of data that I need to have running. This can be to communicate with something in the background. It can be to you know whether you have a database um, or you know, a big operation, something asynchronous that isn't following the async await pattern. You know, there's lots of stuff that will work with this. So now that we have that, go ahead and create a new method. Whoops, there we are. Okay. Go ahead and create a new tester. Now I'm going to be using an observable here. And I'm going to be using this new well, the observable thing we've seen before, but this new method of from event, or sorry, from event pattern. And I'm going to give it the event args with the event fires. And then notice that one of the here we are, overloaded methods is one that takes an action that's going to allow me to subscribe, and another action is going to allow me to remove the handler for the event. I'm going to say, uh, I guess I can say, here's my word. I'm going to say tester dot uh, notify. Okay, my event handler, tester dot from notify. Okay, if you're not familiar with the event pattern, the event system, the not button that has to subscribe to an event, you use the plus equals and then a handler. For that, which is what this unit is, to unsubscribe from an event or to close out if you're done listening to it, you use the minus e. That's going to remove that listener from this event. Okay, but I'm going to actually convert that event into an observable. So now I have this observable that will, will allow me to listen, allow me to do different things with that event. So, first thing we're going to do is subscribe. I'm going to say event fired. ID was within my event args. And my name. Not name. Okay, so now that I've got that, oh, wait. Uh, in my Testing inside of the use the on completed to show that. So when this is completed, I'm just going to say console that right line. There we go. And that's just to show that uh, you can use that particular method to make that happen. So now I can tell my tester class to start. And then I'm going to say that sometime in the future, specifically three seconds from now, we'll go ahead and come back. Okay, now this start and end thing could happen from button clicks inside of a UI. So your user says start, and they click the button, you go ahead and start this thing running. It goes off and does its thing. The user says, okay, end. You go ahead and call end, and this thing stops. Okay, so let's go ahead and let this run. 
melhor. Vai lá para baixo, então. Eu ainda devo limpar uma ainda. Isso. Some events. There we go. All right, so I'm just going to borrow that again. Run. There we go. Okay, so we can see each item coming in asynchronously. These events are being fired. Um, we're using the observer to subscribe that and convert the event to our. Okay, now just like we did before, let's say these events are coming in from some device, some system, some something where I only care about certain values. Again, I can use those same link methods. But where and I can say args Zero. And now I'm going to only get the events that match that. Okay, zero, two, four, done. Okay, likewise, if I want to do something different, I could transform it. So rather than having to deal with you know the event art stuff down here, I could say like so. And now this is really just args so I can eliminate that particular step. I can do other things. Um, I can use my aggregate method. I can append things. I can do things. Actually, I need to start from some particular setup. Okay, I can actually prepend this with a, uh, a piece of data if I want to. Now, in this case, it's an event pattern, which I don't want to have to deal with is that's the best thing to correctly. Okay, so I can use system.reactive, and this is going to be a, so. Okay, so my sender, let's say this, internet cards. And here I can set my initial conditions. Uh, let's say my first one is going to be 50. I guess I was actually not that. But, right. No, we'll just say no. Close that in parentheses. All right, so I can prepend values to this. So I can have an initial set of conditions. Then you can see that does get fed to the pipeline. Then I get my actual data. So there are a lot of things that I can do with this that I wouldn't be able to do with an event by itself. So very, very, very useful. Um, much nicer to work with than the simple event pattern or just subscribing and subscribing. All right, so that should finish up events for uh, observables for us. Let's go ahead and do one more piece of my async enumerable. Okay, you never had to write code because we're running asynchronously, but you needed it to give you some update, some notice of where we are in the process. Okay, so some progress indicator. One thing we could do would be to create a method. And that method can create an action uh, that's going to take a progress and some message. Okay, like so. So you can do that. Another way of doing it would be to have a class that's going to be running this, and that class has an event that gets fired every time progress is handled. And so those are two ways we can do. Um, Nate and I from Mindfire, which I didn't do any announcements up front of this. Um, Mindfire, fantastic. Uh, provide a lot of opportunities for us, a lot of material we need, a lot of the uh, resources we need to do this. So huge hand to Mindfire. Um, Nate uh, 
Franklin Divine Fire, he once worked on a system where we would need to run a particular operation, get the result back from the device that we were talking to, and make a decision based on that of where to go next. Whether to continue, whether to restart, whether we need to wait for a particular amount of time, whether the device rebooted. And all of that was happening asynchronously as they were sending data to the device. So the way they worked it out was to use coroutines and make it work that way. Now that we have IE sync enumerable, we can do that even more obviously and a better way of, of knowing how things are going to happen. So we're going to use IE sync enumerable to do it. And we're going to pretend like we're talking to a Bluetooth device. So I'm going to go ahead and just create a new Bluetooth device, or new, sorry, Bluetooth class, Bluetooth device class. As that loads. We'll just call it Bluetooth device. And I'm going to go ahead and just copy this over because I'm looking at it. It's going to have all these plus and numbers at that point. Okay, that's a regex, that's why I do plus. All right, there's my class. Okay, so nothing really fancy here. Uh, the point isn't to do with the Bluetooth class, what Bluetooth class does is to have something we can use that's going to allow us to pretend like we're talking to a Bluetooth device. So up here in main, I'm going to go ahead and create that. I'm going to say device equals new Bluetooth device. And then I need to give it some data that I can write to the device. To do that, I'm just going to say my file equals a new byte array of 20 kilobytes. And then I'm going to just say fill that with random data. Okay, and then I'm going to pretend like I'm reading that from some file system or a web API or something that is going to return as a screen. Okay, so that's the file that I want to write. And if this were a user interface, I could say you know, something more interesting. So I'm just going to give myself a header here. Now I can come in and create a method going to make this happen. So uh, normally you may be doing things from the Bluetooth device itself, but I'm going to separate it out because method just gets easier. And this is going to take a Bluetooth device. And a, uh, well, this would be useful if I That and I forgot to oh, async enumerable. All right, now my async enumerable here is going to be using another new thing, which is a tuple. And before I do that, I need to create, quickly create this device operation safety one. So I'm going to come up here. Oops. And the same device can be ready. Initialized transfer state for review. All right, so there's my email. So I'm going to be using this new tuple or tuple, however you prefer saying it. I used to say tuple. I like tuple now just because I think it's the wrong way of saying it. I like saying it better. So I'm going to say the first thing in my tuple is going to be a device operation state. And I'm going to call state. Then I'm going to double, which is going to be my current progress. Then I'm going to get a string, which is my message. And that's all going to be a type. So this is actually not a type. So this is a nice thing to be able to. We can see do work async right here is a method that returns I async numerable of that type. Okay, so this is now a type. So inside here, I can do things. Uh, the first thing I want to do is give my initial status. So I'm going to say device operation 
Okay, got it ready. Okay, I have zero percent done. Percent done. And I'm starting my operation. Okay, now I can say wait device dot initialize. Okay, this is going to pretend to go ahead and set up that device to do whatever it needs to do. And then I can say yield return device operation state dot initialize. And for me, that's going to be a 10% completion. And I'm going to starting my data transfer. Okay, now. My data transfer is going to be done over Bluetooth. Bluetooth has a certain packet size and things to do with. I'm going to create a new method to deal with that, which is also going to be an IEC communicator. This time I'm just going to return a double. And we're going to say that, and we're going to use that Bluetooth device and the file. Okay, first thing I'm going to do is say the bytes written are zero. And I'm going to make sure that I am at the beginning of the file. Okay, then I'm going to say as long as there are more bytes to write. I want to do some stuff. So my bytes to write, I'm going to say that it's going to be whichever is smaller, so I don't need bytes or the remainder of the file. Okay, 512 bytes is going to be the max that I can send. That's just a number I've made up depending on the Bluetooth protocol. It's going to be more or less than that. And I'm going to create this chunk of data. It is that big. I'm going to read into that chunk of data that amount. There we go. Oh, comma. Wow. Okay. So go ahead and read into the, the chunk that amount of data. Then I'm going to tell the device to write the device. Going to update the number of bytes written by bytes to write, and I'm going to return my progress. Okay, so this method should be pretty straightforward. If you haven't done with strings before or Bluetooth or anything like that, that's okay. You don't have to worry about that at this particular point. All we're going to see is that I'm setting the file to be at the beginning. I'm saying I've written zero bytes. As long as that zero is less than the length of the file. I'm going to grab either 512 bytes of it or the remainder. So you know, I could be at the end of the file and there are only 100 bytes left, in which case I'll grab 100 because that's that many. I'm going to create a byte array that's that big, copy from the file to the byte array. Then I'm going to write that data to the device. I'm going to update my progress. I write this many bytes. And then I'm going to return a progress value this many bytes out of this file length. Okay, so now that I have that, I can come up here and I can use my wait for each. And I can say in my transfer file AC. Go ahead and pass that down. Okay, and now this is some of the magic of using our code routines, is down here I'm using yield return, return this up. So up here, this thing is well, I guess in this method, this is going to just continue to run without having to have any knowledge of operations or what should be happening. I could put the knowledge here that, okay, after I have written every byte, I need to wait a particular amount of time before I can write the next chunk. Or I can put that up here. Okay, because this is the thing controlling the file the transfer file might make sense over here, because this is the thing that encapsulates the file transfer, might make sense here. I'm gonna put it up here just to show you that I can. But this is going to be the thing that's going to be the thing that can combine my syntaxes between these things. So up here, now that I have 
written part of the file, I want to give progress for how far that file has gone. So I can actually take the progress from this method and pop it up to the thing here wrapped in what I need to have done here. So operation state is in parents to move. Uh, for this, we're going to do some math. So I'm going to say my progress. So writing the file is only 50% of the total operation. So I'm going to say my progress times 0 0.5. That'll give whatever 0 to 100% of the file transfer is only 50% of the value here. But because I've already completed 10% of it, I'm going to add 10% in. So this math right here is going to basically say the file transfer process is 50% of the total operation. This is going to allow me to represent it that way plus what I've already completed. So by the time this is done, I should be at 0.6%. Okay, and I can say transferring file. So this is neat because I can again take the progress of the file, bump it up to here, the color, this thing, bump it up to here. Again, the knowledge up here, the knowledge could be contained in here of how to do this. I can see, okay, I'm in a transfer state. So that means for each one of these packets, I need to be waiting you know, 100 milliseconds between each packet being sent. So that knowledge can live wherever it makes the most amount of sense, including up here in main. Okay, once that file has been transferred, I can say my device separation state is cylinder transfer. I'm going to say that now that it's been transferred, I am 65% of the way done. Okay, I'm going to wait. My device verify. And then I can say that I am now rebooting. Oops. So my state down here is going to do all the work to make this all happen. Um, again, we're using the yield return syntax to give back progress where everything is happening. Okay. And maybe it's not to you, but to me, this is very, very, very concise code. If I were using that action, okay, rather than yield return, I would be calling that action, which as far as the code is concerned, isn't any more work. I'll just be you know, packing in these values to write a new return. I'll just be invoking the function. If it were an event, the same thing would happen. Um, event, 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 event. But the problem is going to happen right here. With an action, I would need to pass in the action to this next file, which means now everything in that chain is going to have to know about that action. That can become problematic because what if up here I know that the file transfer is only 50%? Well, I need to encode that down here as well. What if later on I realize, oh, this is actually going to require another step as an additional 10%? Then I need to add that step from here, post to the action, say now 20%. Now I need to change this so that everything I report to that action has that extra 10% added in. So that's going to become far more complicated. The event is the exact same problem, where here I can fire up that event just fine, but now if I need to add in something else or I realize that something else is you know, in a bad state or you know, something else is wrong, I need to change it at every point in the step. This way, this thing only knows I'm just going from 0 to 100, all I care about. And I can encode what that percentage means up here in the thing that actually knows about this idea of a percentage for the overall progress. All right, so. Um, Again, that, that seems much more concise, much easier to read, giving a status initialized. Start a transfer for each step in the progress. I can report that and off we go. So let's come up here, writing mock file. Okay, and now I do the same thing with for each, and I can say for each update in PC. Here's my device, here's my mock file. Okay, and now in this case, I can actually say lift update.state is initialized. Okay, then I actually need to wait 
an additional second. And let's just say that's the fun thing that I know about. It just needs to happen. Again, I can encode that down here and I do work if I really need to. So I can say, all right, my device is initializing with wait. I can encode it down here if it were part of the file transfer process. It really depends on where you think the business logic should live. But here I'm just making the decision, you know what, this is the thing that's controlling the whole process. This is where I'm going to have a tricky logic if it's initialized. I need to wait and an additional second. This does have the option or the benefit of, you know, this Bluetooth device might be a different type of Bluetooth device. So encoding it up here means if I know this is a particular Bluetooth device and this one requires a delay of a second that the other one doesn't, I don't have to change any of this down here. I can let that logic live up here and all this can just happen. All right, otherwise, I'm just going to say, I am at this particular percentage, now 7%. And then I can say, go ahead and print out the message, and that'll tell me you know, what I'm currently doing. Um, and I can say, let's go ahead and wait, because this last update is going to put me in the reboot state, and I'm going to wait a second again, and I'm putting that knowledge here rather than down here. Um, and then I can just say, I can just complete. All right, again, this is this is a lot, I understand. Um, if you ever want to try this yourself, go for it and give yourself an idea of how much more complicated it is to use events and actions and, you know, and try it. Give yourself something this simple and then you know, have to pass the action or the event down here where I'm firing it off. And what happens when you change something and actually show it yourself. And the reason I know this is because I've done the harder way recently and I switched over to this and realized, oh, it's much better. So let's go ahead and run this. I'll go ahead and put this over here. So writing a file, 0% starting operation, now 10% finished, starting the file transfer. And I could format this and it's only showing two decimal places if I really want to. It wasn't important to me for this, for this particular um, thing. Actually, I'm going to stop this. I'm this to speed up a little bit. So, rather than times two, I'm just going to go up and do that. I need to speed things up a little bit. So, we're not sitting here all night. All right, so we get to 10% really quickly. Um, you can see this is transferring at about you know, one and some change percent, or one and three quarters change percent each step. So past the 50% mark line. And again, this is just to represent that, that this thing is you know, transferring data over some particular protocol. So it's complete. Okay, and we're done. So hopefully this gives you an idea of where you might use high async and removal, whether it be to do some sort of asynchronous work like this, where we have states we're trying to take care of, whether it be to load information in from some web server, or whether it just be something that you need to be doing locally. And either way, this, this should hopefully give you an idea of where AC removal can be used and how to use it. Um, actually, I didn't show you up here. Let me uh, if we call this and just do this. What is that called? Where am I doing AC? Okay. So just like I put down there, I can use link. Um, I think I should do that a little bit, but just to show you, I can check that all are there. I can check that any you know, apply. I can append things. Um, I can cap things. I can count. So all of this, of course, is going to be done asynchronously because this is an asynchronous enable. It can be first. I can be first in default. Um, just you know, all the normal link stuff. 
is here. Max, mean, hyperdrain, reduce, reverse, all that stuff is here. So I do have options to do that um, with the assistant and local, just like I do with regular examples. They just are synchronous. So again, hopefully that gives you an idea of what you can do with AC. With observables, um, same kind of idea where you know you have something that you're needing to trigger. Um, you know, something like the uh, Oh, it was the fun event. Okay. Um, so down here where I have my tester, okay, again, I'm just doing this in line. But again, imagine this is being done through some button click where from there I'm starting and this just runs. So I'm going to pass button away. It just runs and does its thing indefinitely. And I can collect data. And I can be notified of that data. And rather than consoling it, I can append it to some list on the screen or I can add it to a stream that's going to a file. You know, whatever I need to do here, and that's going to happen as that data comes in. I don't have to wait for it. The user can be doing other things on the UI. It doesn't matter. Then that gets stopped and it ends it. This thing finishes rather than just you know, console logging so quick and end. I can close the file, save it off somewhere, you know, aggregate all the data, write it up into a database. Whatever I need to do, all that's happening without me having to worry about enumerating each thing and waiting for that to happen. Um, Again, these are going to be other stuff, displaying data and what have you. So hopefully that gives you an idea of where observables are useful as well. Some of the tricks you can do with them. Hopefully this has been a helpful presentation. Um, again, thanks to Mindfire and all of you for us in the group. I really appreciate all of you. And we'll talk to you later.